The text for the sermon this day is taken from the Gospel lesson, Luke 4, which I'll read in a bit here. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So what we heard a little bit ago, and I'm going to read through in a little bit, is we are in Luke chapter 4, which means, obviously, there's a few chapters that came before it. And one of the things that's helpful for reading Scripture is knowing what happened before. It gives you details and understandings as to what the Gospel writer is trying to emphasize. And so, if you were to go back to Luke chapter 3, you would find that Jesus was at the Jordan River. He was baptized by John. And so when he was baptized by John, the voice came from heaven, You, this is my son, with whom I am well pleased. And then, just after that, Luke records a genealogy. Which is kind of, seems weird that he includes it right there. Because if you ever read Matthew's Gospel, the genealogy is right at the beginning. But in Luke, it's after the baptism. Because it begins with the son of Joseph, and it goes through a whole list of names, and eventually gets to the Son of God. And so it's with that in mind we get to Luke 4, verse 1. And you can follow along on your bulletin, or we can even put it up on the screen if it helps. So it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. So if you ever wonder why we do 40 days for Lent, this is where it comes from. This is also why some take to fasting during these 40 days. I have known people that actually will go all 40 days without food. That's pretty tough, but... The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Notice the very first word. If you are the Son of God. You go back to Luke 3. It was God who said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So in other words, the devil is going back to the same strategy he used all the way back in the garden. Did God really say... He's trying to get Jesus to question God's word, to not trust it. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. Now if you read the Gospel of Matthew and its account of Jesus' temptation, or if you were to look up this verse in Deuteronomy, you know the rest of the words are, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And there is a reason why that is the first temptation. But we'll get, come back to that. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Now understand, this is not a flat earth verse. You be made, the flat earth society likes this verse. It says, see? The, earth, the Bible says the earth is flat. You can see all the kingdoms. <clears throat> this is not a normal situation. Even if you were to get a really tall tower right along I-80, and you're like in, you know, right where 59 was, I don't care how tall, how tall that tower is, you're not going to be able to see Omaha and Lincoln at the same time. Because that's a long ways to look. So, what is going on is a very supernatural thing that they are able to see every single kingdom. He says, To you I will give this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to them to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. So one of the things i got to highlight here 
in the gospel, the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of Luke are the two gospels you go to if you want a detailed account of the temptation. If you go to Mark, it's like one sentence. It's like, he was tempted. Next. So don't go to Mark to help you on that. But one of the things that's of note is that the, the last two temptations are flipped. And so the question is, well, which one got it right? Maybe Matthew got it right. Maybe Luke got it right. Maybe they're both wrong. Well, remember that Luke is not an American. He doesn't think like Americans think. He thinks like a Greek would think. Americans, when we write a story, or Westerners, really, when we write a story, we go point A, point B, point C, point D. Greeks are a little bit odd, at least odd to us. They don't think that way. They put things in order a lot of times because they're trying to emphasize something. So in other words, it may not actually be the order in which it happened. But they want it in that order to emphasize something by that order. But Jesus answered, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And, and the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, notice that all three times, if you are the Son of God, he's calling to him to question God's word. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Look, the devil knows the Bible. He's familiar with scripture. So he knows how to quote it at Jesus. Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. See, there's an ongoing theme in all of that temptation. Questioning God's word or even weaponizing God's word by twisting it. The devil has never changed his schemes. He's always been trying to attack God's word, and so doing, attack our faith. Because the one thing the devil does not want you to do is to worship the one true God. He does not want you to believe that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He wants you to worship anything but him. He'd be okay if you worship Satan, the devil, but he doesn't care if you worship him or not as long as it's not the Lord your God, or more specifically, Yahweh your God. And so on that last temptation, he twists Scripture. This is kind of one of those reasons why it is important to not only know Bible verses, but to know what happens around the Bible verse. So that way you, can, you use it properly. So to give you an example of the ways that we sometimes twist scriptures, the way it's sometimes it's twisted in our own culture. How many of you have ever heard this phrase? God will never give you more than you can handle. Anybody ever hear that one? Can you guess which Bible verse says that? It doesn't exist. Scripture does not teach that. And yet, so very many cling to it for hope. When life is really difficult, they'll say, well, I know God's not going to give me more than I can handle so I can get through this. Jesus, God never said that. Now, how that came to be is because there is a verse that says that God will not allow you to be tempted 
beyond your, what you're able to handle. He talks about temptation, not suffering. In other words, it's telling you that God will provide a way out for temptation. But he does not promise that he will not give you more than you can handle. The very fact that one of, every one of us will one day die shows one day we will reach that thing you can't handle. And furthermore, the reality that we can't handle everything is God's way of forcing us to depend upon him for strength. Or how about this one? God promises you an abundant life. Now when I say that, and by the way, yes, Jesus does say that. He says he promises to give you life, and he promises to give it to you abundantly. Now there are preachers that they'll just yank that one little verse and tell you, name it, name what you want, and claim it. And by the way, if you have some of the same people connected to me on Facebook, you see these circulate, circulating on social media. That you say, so let's say you want to claim, you want to make sure that you're never sick, you have perfect health for the next year, so you have to claim it, and God will make it yours, they teach. Or, you decide, you know what, I want that really, really nice car. Just name that car and claim it and it will be God's. God will give it to you if you claim it in the right kind of faith, they teach. Because as far as they are concerned, the abundant life is an abundance of possessions, an abundance of money, an abundance of good health. And probably the most popular preacher of this can fill, fills up the old Houston Rocket Stadium every single Sunday. This weekend, like every other weekend, they average about 40,000 people a week teaching that very message. And now I know what people say, well, why not just give people hope? Well, it's false hope. And when you don't get it, you'll blame God, you'll resent God, and you will abandon Him. It is a lie from the devil using scripture to twist so that you would abandon the faith. And yes, there are people that have even taken their lives following that teaching to its conclusion. The abundance that God, Jesus, promises is not abundance in this life. He's talking about another life. Or, the devil will convince us that we can't trust the Bible at all to begin with. Sure, you got those scriptures, but you can't trust it. Some guys just wrote it down. It's no different than Aesop's fables. I've known of a few preachers that have said that. There's a few preachers in a certain other Lutheran church body that's common among. That Jesus did not really rise from the dead, they'll teach you. This is why, by the way, if you come on Easter Sunday, which hopefully you do, but Easter Sunday, you'll hear, we won't say, Jesus is alive, alleluia. We will say, Christ is what? Risen. There's a reason. We say risen because risen suggests that at one time he was dead. And there are people in this world that say, well... He didn't rise from the dead, but he is alive in my heart. There is a popular teaching among certain Christians. In fact, it's taught at some seminaries. Calling into question what God says. Calling into question what he teaches. Or the idea that God believe, does not, that you can believe whatever you want to believe. That Jesus is wrong that you should worship the Lord Yahweh, your God. And by the way, there's a reason I say Yahweh. Because you can go back to the Old Testament. Whenever you see Lord in all capital letters, that's where you get the name of God, Yahweh. Sometimes it's helpful to emphasize it, to identify which Lord we are talking about, which God we are talking about. 
that there is one God you shall worship and him alone shall you worship? But there are many who say, well, no, you can worship whatever you want. Believe what you want. You just got to be a good person. Or a halfway decent person, they might teach. Again, calling into question God's word. Now, I know what we'd like to say. We'd like to say, well, those are all those other people. Thankfully, we don't have any problems with God's word, right? A few years ago, I think it was Time magazine. I might be getting the wrong magazine, but I think it was Time. They did a ranking of the most overrated books in America, in the history of the world. And on their list was the Bible. And the reason was, they argued, that so many Christians are talking about it as being God's word, a being of such great value. And yet, how many ever open it up and know what is actually inside of it? So many Christians call the Bible the most important book that has ever been written and yet have no idea what is in it. Imagine if, imagine, imagine somebody who liked Harry Potter. They said, oh, I love the Harry Potter books. They're so good. What happened? I don't know, I just like them. Be like, That's strange. But people do that with the Bible. Like, oh, the Bible is so wonderful, so precious. The word that is in it is so wonderful, but I don't know what happened. Yet, I wish it would be a situation that's a super rare book, like maybe it's the first appearance of Superman, and there's only four copies out there, it costs millions of dollars, and nobody can get access to it. We don't have that problem. You have access to it like no one has ever had. Remember whenever you talk about Luther, you talk about how he went through great pains to get the Bible translated into German, into the common language, so the common person could read it? You have it. I'm, how many of you have a smartphone? Honestly, raise your hand if you've got a touchscreen phone. You have a Bible on your phone. If you don't, you can easily download it. You have, I have a tablet, and you can read any translation. If some reason you only speak Swahili, you could go download a Swahili Bible and use it. Easily. You don't even have to pay anything. And yet how little do we pick up that Bible? How little do we involve it in our daily reading? See, the whole temptation in this and this is the temptation that the devil has been playing from, day, from the garden all the way until now to get us questioning, abusing, devaluing God's word. And so we look at this temptation and we see what Jesus does. Notice every time Jesus does use God's word. And one of the really fun things about when the devil quotes the Bible, if you actually read the passage that he quotes, this is really one of those examples, great example why you need to know what goes on in Scripture, because it's in, it comes from Psalm 91. If you read farther on, it contains the prophecy of the devil's demise. So it's very interesting. He tried to weaponize the verse against Jesus when it's actually a verse written against him. But what we have here is Jesus doing what you can't do. You can't stand against the assaults of the devil. You give in to temptation again and again and again. But Jesus, every single time, he stands firm. There is no temptation he gives into. He doesn't even give into temptation by thought. In other words, he doesn't even think about sinning. That is so. That is how strongly he stands against it, because he became 
perfectly obedient to the law of God because you could not. So that when he went to the cross, as you were here on Ash Wednesday, we talked about this a little bit. When he went to the cross, he was the lamb without blemish. Because he had not sinned in thought, word, or deed by things he had done or left undone. He had not sinned in any shape or form. And so he went to the cross without blemish, and he was laid, he was crucified, sacrificed as our sacrificial king, so that you who could not keep the law would receive his righteousness. That you would be without blemish as he is. So that you may be given the strength to stand against the devil. So that when he comes to call you home, he sees only his own righteousness. See, that's what's going on here. That is why we have this temptation in Mark, in Matthew, in Luke, and Mark, even if it's quick, it's in there. And by the way, Jesus was not tempted just three times. There's only three times that are recorded. Because notice it said it happened over a period of 40 days. And it's not like the devil's talking really, really slow. Over 40 days he tempted, and these are only the three we know about. And he didn't stop tempting him after that. Notice it says he departed from him until an opportune time. Meaning he came back. And he continued to tempt Jesus all throughout his earthly ministry. And he failed every single time. So when we say Jesus was obedient, he was obedient all of those years that he was alive. So he could save you. So he could redeem you with his blood and give you the promise of life. And so why do we concern ourselves with the word? Why do we read the scripture regularly? Find ways to learn the Bible better? Which, by the way, if you want to know a really good way to learn the Bible, use podcasts. But, so I'm talking about you can even access your Bible on your phone or whatever. There are people that read the Bible daily. You can just listen to it. Or you can listen to something like Issues, etc., issuesetc.org wonderful podcast where you can learn a lot about your faith this is why we have bible studies this morning we have bible studies at zimmy's bible studies at subway and i keep mentioning that because i'm hoping to get more people and if you come i might buy you a sub or a soup or whatever you like and one of the things is why we are in that word. And this is even like in our confirmands. Our seventh graders, I started doing this last year, that they have to do a report on a book of the Bible. And so they have to, they can pick out their favorite verse or whatever, and there's some things that they do, but I want them to read an entire book of the Bible and write about it. Because, well, for example, on, two, on Wednesday, when they were signing up their book, well, several of them said that they wanted Philippians because they really loved that verse in Philippians 4 about God who strengthens them, which usually is used for athletes. Very good to read it in context to know that when Paul writes it, he's in prison. Very good to know when you read in the scriptures and you read the fullness of it, you better understand it. In, in our theology at Subway, our Bible study, during the years that we've done this, so we're at about five years we have been doing, because I've been, as of last Sunday, I've been here, as of last Saturday, I've been a pastor here for five years. And so, back in that first year, I started doing theology at Pizza Hut, and then Pizza Hut closed, and went to Zimmy's, and then we moved to Subway. But in that time, we have read through the entire New Testament except for five books. Read through it, discussed it in depth. Why? So we know God's word. And why do we do it at Subway? 
because somebody might be standing in line and they're listening to God's word because the God's word is not just for you to hold inside of yourself. It is for you to tell to your neighbor. Because how are they to believe if nobody has told them? How are they to confess the Lord if you don't speak it? And how can you speak it if you never read it? Be in God's word. Draw people to grace that you have received. Be the instrument. Don't worry, you don't have to save anybody. That is not your job. God does it. But your job is to speak the word to your neighbor. May we do so until he returns. In Jesus' name, amen. May the grace, peace, grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who calls you, saves you, and sends you, keep you in the one true faith, the life everlasting. Amen. Please stand.